Our phones are being designed to addict us, especially social media. Every colour, every font, every flashing light designed like a slot machine in a casino to make us addicted and hooked, which means that in our real world lives, we're all likely to have done this, been in a room with our friends or family, on our phones, our heads and our phones, rather than interacting and being present with the people around us. Well, you're absolutely right. It's not the most obvious subject matter for an economist. But I got interested in the subject of loneliness for three very distinct reasons. The first was I was teaching at university. And what I realized was, this is about five years ago now, more and more of my students were coming to me and in office hours, they were confiding in me that they felt lonely. And this wasn't something I'd seen maybe five or 10 years before, at least not at anything like that scale. So I thought, what's going on here? Why are so many young people feeling so lonely? And this was even before the pandemic. I had bought an Amazon Alexa and I started observing my own interactions with my Alexa, which sits in the kitchen of my house on the table. And I started realizing that I was becoming more and more attached to this little device that lives in my kitchen which got me thinking about what I came to define as the loneliness economy, this entire economy made up of goods and services designed to alleviate loneliness and deliver connection. And I thought, something's going on here. Young people, really lonely. Loneliness affecting how people are voting at the ballot box and the market seeing a big demand for products that deliver connection and community and alleviate loneliness. And I thought, I really want to dig into this subject and understand what's going on. And as soon as I started digging into it, I realized the scale of the problem. I mean, just thinking of some figures, three in five under 35 year olds are lonely always or often. One in five millennials don't have a single friend at all. 60% of over 60s only have visitors occasionally or rarely. In the United Kingdom, two in five pensioners, their main form of company is their television or pet. In Japan, the situation is so bad that the fastest growing group of people being incarcerated are pensioners because so many are so lonely that they're intentionally committing crimes so that they are jailed in order to find company. So I realized the scale of the problem was immense and as immense, unfortunately, in Spain, as immense in Mexico, as immense in Colombia, as immense in Argentina, as immense in other countries that I'm sure viewers of this program are from. This is a global problem. And I realized it's a problem that is affecting our economies, affecting our democracies, affecting our health. And I thought, I need to understand what is going on. Why are we in the midst of a global loneliness crisis? What are the consequences and what can we do about it? So loneliness is that feeling of craving connection, craving intimacy, craving company, and that feeling not being met but it's also something else. It's also that feeling of not being seen, not being heard, being invisible, being ignored. So you can feel lonely in a personal context, but you can also feel lonely in a more existential way. You can feel lonely relative to your workplace, to your government, to your fellow citizens. So for me, loneliness is personal, but it's also political. It's also economic. Its drivers are, yes, to do with how we treat each other, but also to do with how we are treated by our government, by our fellow citizens, by our workplace. Um, and I think it's important to make the distinction between loneliness and being alone. 
because you can actually be alone, be on your own and not feel lonely at all. It's important, I think, to recognize that. Loneliness is that feeling of wanting to feel seen, heard, connected, and not having that feeling met. When I started researching loneliness, I was very interested to understand were certain groups more lonely than others? And what I discovered to my surprise was that the young were the loneliest generation. You think of loneliness most likely as affecting the old the most, but actually it's the young who are the loneliest, the elderly second loneliest. I was also interested in gender. Was there a difference between how lonely men were and how lonely women were? What was interesting was that before the pandemic, it was actually pretty similar. Men and women were roughly as lonely as each other. But what we saw through the pandemic and beyond is that women have become disproportionately lonelier. In the pandemic, I think what happened was, and what helps account for this, is firstly, unfortunately, what we saw was rates of domestic abuse going up during the pandemic. And of course, there's nothing lonelier than being in an abusive relationship. So I think that helps account for the difference. Another reason why I think women became lonelier through the pandemic was they increasingly had to take on not only work, but a disproportionate amount of childcare, a disproportionate amount of housework. And it's lonely if you feel that you're having to do more and nobody's hearing you when you're saying, wow, I feel overwhelmed or I can't cope and nobody's seeing you. So I think that sense of feeling ignored was exacerbated during the pandemic when increasing numbers of women were disproportionately having to take on childcare and housework as well as having to maintain their jobs. The third reason why I think women have become disproportionately lonelier since the pandemic is that we've seen um, the post-pandemic economic downturn affecting women more than men. And even though everyone can be lonely, if you're rich or poor, we do know that there is also a relationship between economic circumstance and loneliness. So with women disproportionately being negatively economically impacted by the economic downturn, it also makes sense that women are feeling lonelier. So everyone can feel lonely, male, female, young, old, but the groups who are particularly lonely need to be acknowledged, the young, the elderly, women, and people on lower economic income. Think of loneliness, we often think about the mental health implications of feeling lonely, and these are very real and very serious. If you're lonely, you are more likely to feel anxious, you're more likely to feel depressed, at the extreme, you're more likely to want to commit suicide. All those are real and very disturbing. But loneliness also affects our physical health in a way that we are probably less aware of. Because we are naturally creatures of togetherness, we are naturally designed to be with others. If you think back to hunter-gatherer man, we were in tribes with other people for our own safety and our own security. What has happened is that when we're lonely, an alarm bell goes off in our bodies, alerting us to this state that actually isn't a desirable state to be in. So this alarm bell goes off internally, we go into fight or flight mechanism, our levels of cortisol go up, our levels of adrenaline go up, all of these impacting our physical health, which is why when we're lonely, we're more likely to have a stroke, 29% more likely. When we're lonely, we're more likely to suffer from heart disease, 34% more likely to suffer from heart disease. When we're lonely, in fact, we are 30% more likely to die prematurely if we're lonely for protracted periods. In fact, loneliness is as bad for our physical health as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. It's the biggest health crisis we're not talking about. I mean, it's incredible when you think about it, something that's so essential for keeping us healthy is something we're not talking about enough. So lonely, really threatening our physical health and our mental health. 
but loneliness also really impacting our democracy. In my research, linking the rise of right-wing populism across the world and loneliness, what I found was that lonely people tend to see the world as a more hostile, more threatening place. And as such, are easy prey for politicians who categorize the world as such. There's actually research that shows that when a mouse is put alone in a cage and left in a cage for a period, the longer the mouse is left in the cage, the more aggressively it lashes out to a new mouse when a new mouse is introduced. Of mice, of men. And that's really what we've been seeing politically across the world. Politicians preying upon lonely people, weaponizing community in their pursuit of votes. So if we think about Donald Trump, again on the ascendancy in the United States, with his rallies, with his message of you, the forgotten people, I'm speaking to you, with his promise of community, you see how this could land with people who are feeling lonely. So loneliness affecting our politics too. And then loneliness affecting our economies in meaningful ways. 40% of office workers, even before the pandemic, felt lonely at work. In Mexico, it's even 44%, even higher. And why this matters is because lonely workers are less motivated, less productive, more likely to quit than workers who don't feel lonely. So loneliness creating a really serious economic cost, not just on the economy as a whole, but actually on businesses. In fact, the single biggest determinant to whether someone will feel engaged at work is whether or not they have a friend at work. And yet how many companies are really consciously thinking about what they can do to make their employees feel more connected to each other? So, so many problems that loneliness creates, but so much that we can do. So I am not a typical academic in some ways. Uh, when I write my books, and including my latest book, The Lonely Century, of course I did a lot of academic research, very deep scientific research, read hundreds and hundreds of the most recent scientific literature. But I also went around the world interviewing people, meeting people, and having some quite unusual experiences myself in order to really understand the loneliness phenomenon. One thing I did was when I was in New York, I rented a friend. I had learned in my research that you can rent a friend. And actually on the website where I found Brittany, the woman who I ultimately rented, there were 600,000 friends to rent, of which I picked Brittany, a 20-something-year-old college student from America who I met in a cafe downtown Manhattan for a matcha coffee. I mean, I was a bit worried before I met her. I'd never done something like that before. I didn't know if friend was perhaps shorthand for something less salubrious, but no, it actually was friendship she was offering. And for a few hours, I hung around downtown Manhattan with her. I went to a bookstore, I went to a clothes store. We tried on sunglasses, we tried on hats. We had a really fun time until we were in the shop. She turned around to me and she said, Narina, your time is up. That'll be $140, please. <laughs> Um, it was quite an interesting experience because for much of it, I forgot that I was paying her. It felt, obviously it didn't feel like being with an old friend, but you know when you meet a new friend and you have a nice vibe and you're chatting, <laughs> that's what it felt like. She was laughing at all my jokes. Of course she was, I was paying her. <laughs> but when I asked her later, who hires you? Her answer was very insightful. She said, typically 30 and 40 year olds, women as well as men, people who've moved to New York, are working very hard, people in consulting, finance, tech, who are lonely, who don't have time to make new friends, who are coming home in the evening and don't even have anyone to go out for a coffee with or someone at the weekend to go to a movie with or go to an art gallery with. And so they're hiring me to do that. And it's quite a statement about the age we live in that people are so lonely that they're having to pay 
for friendship. An even more extreme example was Carl. Um, when I was in Los Angeles, I met a gentleman called Carl. Carl was a 50-something-year-old man, professional man, had a good job in the media industry. He had moved to Los Angeles, he was divorced, and he was working very hard and he found it very hard to make friends because he was working so hard. He said at the office, you know, everyone had their headphones on, nobody was really connecting. He was lonely at work as well. And he heard that you could pay to be cuddled. Not in a sexual way. And he said he tried it and he went and paid to be cuddled by this woman, Jean. And he said it was transformative. He would pay to be cuddled. He would have somebody put their arms around him, hug him, have that touch that he felt so bereft of. It transformed, he said, how he felt. He was more productive at work. He was happier. His life was transformed. And then he said he started you know, doing this on a weekly basis and it wasn't cheap. I said, how are you affording it? His answer was shocking. He said, well, in order to afford this, I now live in my car. This was a gentleman who had a decent job working for a media company to all external purposes, you know, seemed, you know, like a regular fe fellow. But he was so craving connection that he was living in his car, keeping his food in his fridge at work, showering at the 24-7 gym in order to be able to pay to have that sense of connection on a regular basis. In California, I also had an interesting experience when I met the world's first burger-flipping robot chef, Flippy. We are living in a world in which robots, especially now enabled by artificial intelligence, AI, are increasingly going to take over jobs. And in this context, I met Flippy, the burger-flipping robot chef who, as far as an employer concerned, is a great hire. I mean, he's never sick. He always flips his burgers perfectly. He never complains. He never complains about how many hours he has to do either. Um, and it was an interesting phenomenon to speak to some of the employees in this place who were now working alongside the chef. I asked them what it felt like to work alongside a robot. And they said, well, you didn't have the chat that you would normally have in the workplace. And they were worried. Would it be their jobs Flippy would come for next? It's a cautionary tale, really, for the future, because as robots and as artificial intelligence becomes ever smarter, the more likely we all are to get replaced by flippies or the flippy equivalents in our own domains. I mean, not just people on burger lines, but people like you, people like me, journalists, writers, thinkers, marketers, lawyers, accountants, all these jobs now increasingly under threat by artificial intelligence and robots. It's estimated that almost 300 million jobs are going to be under threat from artificial intelligence over the next five years. Which raises huge questions for society. If we're already feeling lonely, disconnected, unseen, unheard today to the degree that we are, how will we feel if we don't have work, if we don't have a workplace, if we're worried about how we're going to earn, if we don't know what we're going to do so big implications there as well. There is an architecture of loneliness, for sure. Loneliness isn't only impacted by how we treat each other, but also by our physical spaces. There's a lot of research that shows that cities, for example, that are designed for cars rather than people, are especially lonely. And I know that in Spain, Barcelona has actually been leading the way in terms of creating urban spaces which are walkable, where cars 
are actually dissuaded so that people can walk around, get to know their neighbors in a more meaningful way. So the ratio of cars to people, to pedestrians, plays a big part in how lonely people in a community feel. Another thing that plays a big part when it comes to architecture is how empty or otherwise our high streets are. Over the last few years, and I'm not sure if it's the same in Spain or in Mexico or in Argentina, but one of the things I've noticed in the United Kingdom and in America is that we've seen high streets increasingly having empty shops in them. And why that matters is that our local shops are often places that help alleviate how lonely we feel in our day-to-day -day lives. Because if I imagine my local high street, I can go into the greengrocer and I can say hello to Phil, who works there. I've known him now for years. And you know what, if I don't have my purse with me <laughs> and I say, Phil, do you mind if I come in later to pay? He'll say, okay. Or I can go into my local bookstore and chat to the person who sells there, Jessica, and she'll help me. Or I can go into my local cafe and speak to Morford, who even has bowls of water for the local dogs who can come there. So those moments and research has shown that even just the 15 second exchange with your local barista can make a huge difference to how connected you feel. Those local shops are very important in making us feel connected. And what's happened in a lot of local areas is that because of increasing rent prices and the problems in the global economy, we're seeing increasing numbers of these shops left unoccupied and that creates a problem of loneliness. Another thing that accelerates loneliness or amplifies loneliness in a local geography is when you don't have enough spaces where people can come together and do things together for free. There is an infrastructure of community that we need governments and local governments to make sure that they are funding in order to help us feel connected to each other and not lonely. We need public libraries to be funded. We need youth clubs to be funded. We need old people's day centers to be funded. We need um, places where young parents and young mothers can come and be with other young mothers to be funded, or at least for the market to deliver them at very competitive prices. Because we need spaces to do things together, to be with others, if we are to feel connected and not alone. And one of the tragedies we've seen globally, really since the financial crisis of 2008, has been a steady defunding of this infrastructure of community in Spain, as is the case elsewhere too. So that's something to be really mindful of, making sure that these spaces are funded, or making sure that the market sees the opportunity in providing these functions at a lower cost. In South Korea, for example, there are daytime discotheques targeted to the over 65s. I love this idea. Daytime discotheques where thousands of elderly people dance in the daytime. Um, these are profit-making businesses, but because they're operating at scale, the market has seen opportunity here. And when I'm old, I would love to be dancing in the daytime, feeling connected to others. So this is something for entrepreneurs to be thinking about as well. We're living in a time of aging populations. We're living in a time when the two groups who are the most lonely in society are the young and the old. So what are the market opportunities for you when it comes to designing and delivering products and services that deliver connection. Lots for entrepreneurs to think about here too. So historically, employers didn't really think about connection in the workplace. And actually what we saw was a trend, an active trend before the pandemic of workspaces moving from offices to open plan settings. And this was actually sold, interestingly, as a way to make employees feel more connected to each other. The idea was you didn't have the walls and employees would feel more connected to each other. The truth was the very opposite happened. 
these spaces became open plan and as researchers found, instead of employees speaking more to each other, they actually spoke less to each other and communicated more by email or message. I don't know if you've ever worked in an open yeah. plan office, but I have and the experience for me makes sense of that research because firstly, open plan offices, they're very noisy. So if yeah. you're somebody who likes to focus like me, I would have these big headphones over my ears. And if there's anything that's a sign, don't come and speak to me, it's you sitting there with yeah. big headphones on. The other thing is that in an open plan offices, everyone else can hear your conversation. So of course, you're not really going to ever open up authentically and confide in someone when everyone else can hear in. And there's a performative quality to your um, communication, which, which itself means that you don't really feel connected to others. So workplaces under the promise of delivering more connection actually started feeling even more disconnected, which helps explain why even before the pandemic, as much as 40% of office workers felt lonely and disconnected. The pandemic, of course, has made this even worse because however lonely you were in the office, when you're connecting more and more via Zoom or video call, you're obviously going to feel even less connected to others. And now we even have generation, a whole generation of new workers in the workplace who, you know, maybe have spent only part of their time physically in contact with others. So really don't have the opportunity, haven't had the opportunity to build friendships and build connections. And from an employer's point of view, this is very worrying. Firstly, because Lonely workers are less productive, less motivated, and more likely to quit. Secondly, because you're more likely to feel disengaged with work if you don't have a friend there. And thirdly, because of course work is going to feel more commodified. You're more likely to just move to another company who's offering you more money if you don't feel connected to your fellow employees. And that is a real worry for employers. So what I'm seeing is more and more employers really trying to think actively about how do we make the workplace feel more bonded and more connected. And there's actually one very easy hack that has a very good result. It's encouraging your employees to eat together. There was research done in Chicago with firefighters and the researchers found that the companies of firefighters who ate together were much more likely to feel bonded to each other, but also much more likely to perform better than companies of firefighters who didn't eat together. So eating together, great way of helping your staff feel more connected to each other and also performing better. But also more generally in the workplace, how do you help your staff, your employees, feel more recognized, feel more noticed, feel more seen? That is absolutely critical too. And sometimes it's just about being kind to each other. Sometimes it's about just recognizing, oh, you know, thank you for helping me. Those little things. Sometimes it is as simple as going around the room in a meeting and saying, I'd like to acknowledge Manuel because he really did a great job. Those moments, those moments of recognition and appreciation can make a huge difference. Well, I'm really glad you brought this up because social media is in many ways the tobacco industry of the 21st century, harming people in very real ways and needs to be recognized as such, especially when it comes to how lonely people are feeling. As part of my research, I interviewed many young people, teenagers. And one thing that kept on coming across from their stories was how lonely social media was making them feel. Peter, a 14-year-old boy, telling me about how he would post on Instagram and then be waiting, 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 hoping for somebody to like his posts. And then when they wouldn't, would feel so invisible, so ignored, and be asking himself, what am I doing wrong? Why is nobody recognizing me, acknowledging me? Or Claudia, a 16-year-old girl who told me that her friends after school had said they weren't going out. And then she was on her social media feeds scrolling and she saw them out, having fun without her. And she said she felt so excluded, so lonely, she 
hid in her room and wouldn't go to school for a week. It's not that kids weren't excluded in the past, of course they were, but nowadays, firstly, the adult in a child's life is often not aware of it. So a teacher isn't seeing a child not being invited to something because often the socializing is happening virtually, not in the real world. But also the shame of exclusion is so public, is transmitted amongst their peer group 24 seven. So you have social media creating a sense of exclusion for those who are not invited in. Then there's the abuse that young people especially are facing on social media. Particularly bad, it turns out, in Spain, in Mexico, in Brazil. Particularly bad. Those countries and the United States, those four countries in the top 10 of countries when it comes to cyber bullying. The figures are astounding. I mean, 60%, 70%, 80% of young people facing, experiencing cyber bullying on a daily basis. And of course, if you're being bullied online, you are going to feel more alone, especially if people are not intervening. And even if you're not directly being bullied or facing some sort of abuse, just seeing that that is the world you live in, of course, is going to make you feel more alone. That's something very worrying. And then there's just the fact that social media rewards us for aggressive, hateful behavior in a very real way. The more hateful your tweet, the more hateful your post, the more likely it is to get reposted, the more likely you are to get likes. So the mechanisms themselves incentivizing abuse and hatred and bullying. And then there's just the fact, the addiction that we all have now to our phones, because our phones are being designed to addict us, especially social media. Every color, every font, every flashing light designed like a slot machine in a casino to make us addicted and hooked, which means that in our real world lives, we're all likely to have done this, been in a room with our friends or family, on our phones, our heads and our phones, rather than interacting and being present with the people around us. There's actually research that shows that even if our phones are off, when you have a phone on the table between you, you are less likely to feel connected to the person in front of you, less likely to feel empathetic towards them than if you don't have a phone with you. And it's not just teenagers who are experiencing this. It's not just teenagers who are guilty of this addiction. We all are. You know, our phones have become our lovers, our mistresses, <laughs> and we are all in thrall of them. So when we think of today's loneliness crisis, there are many reasons for it. The fact we do less together with others than in the past, we're less likely to go to church. We're less likely to be members of trade unions. We're less likely to go to parent-teacher associations. The fact that our cities are increasingly designed for cars, not for people. Urbanization, cities are particularly lonely places and rural communities where people are left behind, lonely also as a result. But social media and technology playing a huge role also, importantly, in how disconnected we feel. So much that can be done on this front, much that needs to be done on this front, I take a digital Sabbath, one day a week, where I put my phone away so it's not in arm's reach, so that I can be more consciously there with my family, with my friends. Other people who do this say that they really have seen the results. It's something really worth trying, just one off. But governments have to intervene here too, because it's not enough to say that this is something we can solve. Governments need to act, and the United Kingdom where I'm from, has actually really taken the lead in this regard with new legislation that's come into effect, the Online Safety Bill, that is going to put much more pressure and legal responsibility on social media companies, especially when it comes to abuse, when it comes to children. So, especially when it comes to children, what are the 
governments in Spain, in Mexico, in Colombia, in Argentina doing to protect the mental health of their children? A lot that can be done because we cannot let social media companies regulate themselves. They clearly are incapable of doing so. One thing we can do is try and put our phones away more. I know this is hard because I know that we're addicted to our devices, but with some sort of effort, we can do this. Often it helps really to put your phones so that they're not in physical reach in the evenings or at weekends, or take a digital Sabbath, a whole day off where you're not on your phones. Another thing we can do is we can consciously spend more time doing things in our local communities. So we can support our local communities, by which I mean show up at a local fair or event, volunteer for a local community service or offering. Another thing we can do is actually make sure that instead of ordering a book online or doing a yoga class on YouTube with Adrienne, we actually go to a local bookshop or we go to a local uh, gym because actually doing things in person and having that opportunity to have just even a short exchange with our teacher or a receptionist or a bookseller can make a huge difference to how connected we feel. We also should think about volunteering. There's a lot of research that shows that when you volunteer, when you help others, you feel much less lonely, much more connected to others. And of course, you're also doing good at the same time. So that's another proven thing to do. Also, when you volunteer, you are more likely to live longer. So that's another bonus for doing that. So three really conscious things we can do if we're feeling lonely. And maybe one final thing to think about if you're feeling lonely. Is there something you're interested in? Something you're passionate about? Maybe it's, I don't know, your local soccer team. Maybe it's painting. Maybe it's dancing. But what is it? And is there a community you can engage with who has a similar interest? Sometimes that's the way if you're feeling lonely to find people to connect with and do things with to help alleviate how you feel. Mm -hmm.